Welcome to Close Up with Perry Nemiroff. This is the movie segment that brings you closer to the artists that create the movies that you know and love. And I am honored to call the very first Close Up guest, Michael Shavs, the director of The Nun 2. Hello, and I'm so happy to have you here. Hello, Perry. Thanks so much for having me. First guest on Close Up. High, high honors right there. I know. I'm so excited. I'm such a fan, and uh, it's so cool to, uh, to be here. The first question is, what was the very first movie you saw that made you walk out of the theater and say to yourself, like, that was absolutely amazing. I need to create stories like that for the big screen. It was Jurassic Park. I, I know, and I know you're a fan. I, I love that movie so much. I saw it with my dad, and it was one of those, it was like right as I was starting to make movies with my friends. And, you know, when I saw that movie, I mean, it was such like, I mean, it was such an epic moment. It was such a cultural moment. It was this incredible summer blockbuster. And I just remember, you know, at the at the end, like seeing like Spielberg's card come up. And I was like, oh my gosh, this guy is a legend and amazing. And I really connected him so much with that movie. And I was, it, it really was so, so inspiring. All right. I'm going to move on to a different movie now. I want to know what is the first movie you saw that you took home with you? Whether it was a horror movie that kept you up at night, a movie that made you go out and buy all the toys, you name it. You know, in terms of like horror movies, and bringing it home, like Nightmare on Elm Street, the um, the Dream Warriors, the third one, and I rented that. <laughs> so I guess that counts as bringing it home. I There's rented a reason it from... I wore this shirt today. Oh my gosh! I remember nice. that comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love that movie, and it's like I my mom rented it for me, and it was um, I have no idea why she did, but I'm so glad she did. It was like the first horror movie that I that I saw, and it was like such a great entry into being a horror movie fan because it was, it wasn't just, I mean, it was scary as hell. It was also, it had a really fun idea. I loved them, the idea of them fighting Freddy. I think there was also so much craft in that. And even being really young, you could see just like all of the artistry that went into that movie. Like the, like, I think there was a stop motion sequence and, you know, the, the creature effects and the makeup effects were so amazing. And, you know, talking to, talking to people who work in horror, I mean, they get so inspired by those movies. And it's really just that old school artistry, which really inspires them. And it really inspired me at the time. Do you remember the first movie that made you feel the power of movie magic, where when it was over, you realized that the real world had entirely melted away and you were wholly enveloped in whatever reality that movie was presenting? I think Back to the Future, I think for like a first time, like one of the earliest experiences and I just remember like I love that movie and I keep on going back to it and it's like it's one of my favorite movies and it's just the the energy and the tone and the mix of genre and I love how it tells a family story in, in a genre film but like the the experience of it was so awesome seeing it as a kid and I came out of it and it's like I wanted to be like a scientist I wanted to like invent like time travel I was like oh my gosh this is so awesome and it's because everyone who comes out of that probably wants to be like Marty McFly or like Michael J. Fox you know, but I was like, no, I want to be Doc Brown. So, um, yeah, no, that totally, I was swept away in that and really, uh, really loved that movie. I feel like that was a healthier scientific dream to have than me walking out of Jurassic Park thinking like, I want to buy amber and create dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> Going back a little bit, for all the aspiring directors out there, when you first recognized the dream to become a professional director, what did you think was step one to making that happen? And now that you've done it, would you recommend that as a first step to other aspiring directors or or have you found something that was more effective along the way? I think just making stuff. I think that that was the, you know, because when I first started doing it, I wasn't even thinking about it strategically. It's like you do it as a kid is, you know, at least that's how I got into it, just making movies with my friends. And I think that that was just doing it and making things. And it's so easy, I think, when you get older to come up with roadblocks or excuses like why you shouldn't be making something. But, you know, there's less... There's less obstacles now than there ever was. Like you can, you know, you can make a movie on your phone. You can put it on the internet. I mean, if you have those two things, if you, there's no reason to stop yourself. And I think it's just, it's so easy. I think that, you know, there's never been more access and people are out there like, dying to see the stuff that people make. And, you know, if you're, you know, a filmmaker out there, you know, you, you got to just make it and and don't follow the trends. Just try and do things that like go against the trends or things that are true to yourself and and just get it out there. You know, the biggest roadblock, uh, honestly, I think at this point is just like ourselves and, you know, the kind of, 
you know, getting out of our heads or come, you know, getting rid of the excuses and just kind of just making something. When it comes to The Nun 2, what is a brand new filmmaking technique that you're using on that film that you have not used on your previous Conjuring Verse movies? You know, one of the things with the – I wanted it to have a really unified visual style. And I really wanted to to really create that world of the 50s. And um, as, as boring as it sounds, we just created this Google Doc. And I really liked it because in the past I had like lookbooks and PDFs that I would send to the crew. But the problem is when you're making a movie, like every week it's like something's changing. You're getting a new location or – you're losing a location or you're getting an update on some design. And so it's hard to like keep it, like keep everyone on the same page. And so I was like, we got to just create a live document. We got to just like create this Google doc. So we poured like all this research into it. And my, I had a French crew and, you know, that was actually just having like a visual reference was such a great way to kind of get over any language barriers or any miscommunication. So everyone was just going to the document and, you know, we would put like photos from the fifties. And so it just became this kind of living lookbook and then would update it with location photos. And um, it was a great way to work. And it was a great way that anyone at any time, if you had a connection to the internet, you could see how the movie was developing. And I'd send it to the studio back home and, you know, they could see as like as it was developing. And I think it was just such a great way to, to make everyone feel included in the process. Are there fun Easter eggs in there? There's Easter eggs throughout the movie. And it's fun because it's like in very, you know, some of them are just Easter eggs. Some of them are like connections to the universe and and even bigger ideas that I won't give away, but that uh, that tie things together that I'm really proud of. I think fans will love it. I think that, you know, whenever we've screened it for fans, I think it's a, it's a great entry point for people who don't know the series. They totally get sucked in. It's also, I think, for fans, it's really rewarding because it, it, it brings a lot of things together in one mo- movie. Clearly hardcore fan. I like looking for all the Easter eggs. And still to this day, one of my favorite is in uh, Conjuring 2 when Valak's name is hidden all throughout the movie. <laughs> there might be some stuff like that. There, uh, you, I think... Um, I love that too. I think that, that that's always really fun. I think it's like whenever you're engaging the the viewer, there's, you know, the one of the things that, you know, with that newsstand sequence, it was actually kind of inspired by like in in France there's this thing where it's kind of like graffiti, but it's like this this thing where they'll make faces out of ordinary objects, but just like street objects. So it's kind of like like street art, but like if there's like a manhole cover and it has two holes in it, they'll do like a little smile or something. And so you see it, like you go down the streets of, of France and it's like, it's everywhere. And it's like, it's like this cultural thing. Um, it has a name. I actually blanked on it. I name. was going to say, that sounds like something that probably has a term that applies to it. And is it safe to assume you use that and then make it horrifying? Well, the idea with it was like that You know, Valak was, is like the deceiver. Valak is the, you know, this kind of trickster. Demons are, you know, take different forms. And, you know, there's, so I was thinking about like visual trickery and visual deception. So I was like, you know, it would be great if there's like different ways that she's kind of hiding in plain sight or hiding in the environment. And so part of that is like, you know, the newsstand's like one example of that. But then we iterate on that idea throughout the movie. And what's great is like, there's even moments in it where I, I've shown it to people who have worked on the movie and they're convinced that they see the nun in places that maybe she is, maybe she's not. And I think that that's like the fun of just being engaged in that way. And, you know, this is my dream come true. <laughs> like, that's what I want. I want to leave the nun too concerned that I'm seeing Valak everywhere. <laughs> Here's something that Storm said to me recently that I did want to ask you about because she was telling me that her character in the movie, she specifically used the word adds funkiness to the film. And just like funky is not something that I would usually apply to a Conjuring movie. So what does she mean by funkiness? I think probably it's her rebellious nature. I think that, you know, she's, Deborah was always written as a rebel. She was always written. She's basically this young novitiate in the same situation that Irene was uh, in the first film. But now Irene is like the senior member of the team and, and Storm is the, you know, the kind of the young willful nun that's, that's uh, following along with her. So I think that's probably what she's talking about. I think she definitely brings just like a spirit and, and you know, she kind of balances out uh, Irene. So again, I've already said that I like to take these movies home with me, but I'm curious if that has ever happened to you as a director. When you're making The Nun 2, are there any creepy things that happen on set, or are there any ideas that we'll see in the movie that you have found sticking with you? I think there's one scene I'm really... I, I love... It's the uh, this this very simple sequence that uh, in the stairwell... And Sophie is this young girl, one of our, the leads of our movie, and she's um, a student at this this boarding school that 
most of the film takes place at. She gets lured into this uh, this stairwell, and it's um, you know the boarding school is like this really old boarding school, and it was like bombed. You know, it's this is the 50s, but you know it was bom- bombed and like burnt out during uh, World War II. So as she kind of goes up in the stairwell, it's um, it gets darker and it's more burnt. And so she kind of takes a couple twists and turns. And it's just, it's such a simple scene, but it really, really works. And I think every time I see it, I'm always sucked in. I think um, it just, you know, it's one of those scenes where everything works. So. Okay. Now I got another another scene on the list that I'm really looking forward to. That is a wrap on the very first edition of Close Up with Perry Nemiroff. Michael, thank you so much for being our very first guest. Thank you, Perry. This was awesome. And to everybody out there watching, of course, do not miss The Nun 2 in theaters on September 8th.